Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He said, pray in this manner. Pray like this. Pray this way. He didn't say, now repeat after me. Repeat these exact words. Say them over and over and over again. That's not at all what he said. He's given us a pattern, a blueprint, a model prayer. Pray like this, after this manner. This is the way that you're supposed to pray. The New King James Version, you know, it gives a title above each passage and they really got this one right because they call it the model prayer. And that's exactly what it is. It is a model prayer from the master prayer. Nobody prays better than Jesus. By the way, he's at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us. But you just got to know that when Jesus was here on this earth, he prayed powerful prayers. He knows how to pray. That's why the disciples were like, Lord, teach us to pray. But this is a model prayer for us. Ian Bounds, uh, a man of God that just has written so many great books about prayer. And he says this, the outline and form are complete, yet it is but an outline with many a blank, which needs our needs and convictions to fill it in. And see, we need to understand, this is not just some religious ritual where you pray the Lord's Prayer. No, this is a pattern to show us how to pray. Last week, we talked about learning to have a father mindset that when we come to him, we always are aware that we're talking to our father. You know, this was really a new thing for the Jews when Jesus comes on the scene and he's saying Father all the time and saying pray like this, our Father. That's one of the reasons that they took such offense at him is because he implied that he had this special relationship with God that they didn't have. Well, that's the way it was. He did. But if you look through the Old Testament, you will never see a time where a man of God was praying to God and saying, Father. Jesus comes on the scene, the only begotten of the Father. And we get to say, Father, because he's the firstborn among many brethren. We are born of him. How wonderful to be able to say, Father, to the Almighty God. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. It is an amazing thing to be called the children of God. And and I I don't want to be ugly about this in any way. But when people in this world say we're all children of God, that is a lie. And the reason I need to point that out is because you need to understand how special it is to be a child of God, to be born of God. The scripture says in 1 John that his seed is in you. See, you're literally born of God, born of his spirit. How wonderful to be a child of God and to be able to call him Father. He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. He is in heaven. That's as far as we're going to get tonight. I know we're starting off slow. Next week, it's going to be slow one more time. After that, we're actually going to do whole verses. It'll be like warp speed, right? Not exactly. 
But I tell you, there's so much here and we need to get it. But the reason we're going so slow here at the beginning is because it is so important the way that we come to God in prayer, the attitude and our heart when we come to God in prayer. Now, I don't know if this really fully does it justice, but just to illustrate just a little bit, those of you that are parents, if your child comes to you and they want to ask you for something, does it matter to you what their attitude is? I want a new iPad. I want you to go get it now. How many of you are going to go get it? None of you. Those of you that are an employer or you have some people under you at work, if they come to you, does it matter to you what their attitude is when they make a request of you and they say, hey, I need an extra day off? Does it matter to you if they're cocky or smart aleck or if they're humble? And I'm just telling you this, that with our Heavenly Father... We need to have the right heart and the right attitude when we approach him in prayer. Now, we talked about that a lot last week, and I'm not going to go over it all again. But I just want you to understand that we're coming to him as our father, but we are also coming to him as the God of heaven. He's in heaven. And I'm telling you, that is a a loaded statement. There's so much to that. We come to him as the confidence of a child to their father. But we also come to him as an almighty God, all-powerful. Now, see, he's not unapproachable to us. He's not unavailable. No, he's our father. We can come to him anytime. He's my father. And at the same time, he is the all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing, reigning, sovereign God of the universe. That's the one we're talking to. What an amazing thing that that one is our father. But that's who we're talking to. And I absolutely stand against this false doctrine that you just talk to him like he's your pal. That is so wrong. That is the wrong attitude to talk to the king of the universe. Yes, he's your father, but you treat him with the utmost respect. You come to him humbly. You don't talk to God with pride. Religious pride is the worst kind. And he abases the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. See, when you go to prayer, you don't want God to resist you. No, you want his grace. I realize that tonight it may seem like we're reading a lot into this small phrase that he is in heaven, but I'm telling you it will bear out in Scripture. You know, I said the the Jewish people at that time were unfamiliar with referring to the Almighty as their father. But they had a great understanding of what in heaven meant. We need to know and understand what that means. That our father is one who reigns in majesty, in heaven. It speaks of his power and authority, that he's sovereign, that he's omniscient, omniscient, that his watchful eye is over all of us, all of the time, no matter where we are. You can't hide in the dark. No, he sees and he knows everything. Psalm 33, 13 through 15 says, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. God sees. He has such a different perspective than what we see. I mean, 
what a tiny little bit we see. He sees everything. He knows what's going on in our world. He knows every detail. He sees the things that are unseen. He sees the spiritual battle and the forces that are at work. He knows what's taking place even in the hearts of men. He sees our hearts. Hebrews 4.13 says, There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I mean, he sees everything. There's nothing hidden from his gaze. So when we pray our Father in heaven, we're praying to a Father who knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what the situation is. He knows exactly what our needs are. When Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting for God to fulfill the promise to give them a son, they decided to try to have a son through their servant girl, Hagar. And so when Hagar conceives, Sarah becomes jealous of her and she mistreats her. She mistreats her so bad that this pregnant servant leaves and goes out into the wilderness by herself. Can you imagine a pregnant woman in the wilderness by herself? And the angel of the Lord comes and speaks to her. And he tells her, Go back to your mistress, to Sarah, and submit yourself to her. He tells her, I'm paraphrasing, but he tells her, it's going to be all right. And I'm going to bless your son. Now, here's something that Hagar really got that all of us need to get about the one we're praying to who is in heaven. She gave the Lord this name. He is the Lord who sees me. Here she was in the wilderness all by herself in a desperate situation and God shows up. She realized that no matter where she was, what was going on, there is a God who sees her. And you need to know that our Father in heaven, He sees it all. Everything that's going on And you know, one of the things that religious people say and even lost people will say is, well, then why doesn't he do something? Because he's waiting for somebody to pray. Oh, how we need to pray. But he knows our situation better than we do. Last week we read in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 that he knows what we have need of even before we ask. He sees, he knows, he's not surprised. He knows the beginning and the end. But he waits for us to ask him in faith. So we need to realize the greatness of our God, our Father in heaven, who looks down from heaven. Psalm 14, 2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. See, we're never away from his watchful eye as we pray, we need to pray with an awareness that he sees all and he knows all. He knows what you need. You don't don't have to tell him all the details. You You don't have to tell him exactly how bad everything is. He already knows that. Now, sometimes it makes us feel better to tell him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just to spill it all out and tell him all about it. And you know what? We can do that. But I just want you to understand that He just wants us to come and invite him to intervene. He wants us to come to him and ask. That's what he's waiting on. He waits for our invitation. He is in heaven. It reminds me in my prayer not to be too earthly minded. Oh, how we can be earthly minded. 
Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. We need to focus most of our prayer on things that are going to matter in eternity. The Bible says this life passes quickly. It, it says it is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. How many of you are old enough to know it goes fast? Some of you. Some of the rest of you, you're going to find out. But it's just a vapor, I'm telling you. And in, and in the picture or in view of eternity, it really is just a vapor that passes away. And so when we realize our Father is in heaven, it helps us to focus on this truth that what really matters in this life are the things that impact eternity. We don't need to be so earthly minded in our prayer. But we need to be mindful of the things that matter in eternity and in heaven because our Father is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is laid up for us in heaven. We have an inheritance in heaven. We have a reward in heaven. We have a treasure in heaven. Our names are written down in heaven. And our Father is in heaven. That's a powerful beginning to a prayer. Psalm 103, verse 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. See, when we think of our Father in heaven, we need to think of this, that God is great king over all, that he rules and he reigns over all. That's what the Bible says. He is awesome. There's not anything that he can't do. We see all this crazy stuff going on in our world, but we need to know that our God has the power. He has the authority over it all, yeah. over all the nations. Our Father reminds us, when we say our Father, it reminds us that we're praying to the one who can do absolutely anything. Don't limit God in your prayers. Carmen and I have a favorite verse. We've got a whole bunch of favorites, but we have our favoritist verses. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. We are praying to a God who can do way far and above what you can think. The NIV says, imagine. See, you just let your mind run wild. Whatever you can come up with, he can do way far and above that. You see, we're so finite and he's so infinite, it's hard for us to really understand how vast he is. But even the greatest imagination you could ever come up with, he can do way more than that. You can't even imagine. We need to realize we're praying to that God, to an infinite God that has no limits. That's what Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. So we come to him with confidence and the security of a child coming to their father, but we come knowing at the same time that this loving father is the almighty God, the ruler of the universe. You know, when you consider the vastness of the universe... Trillions and trillions of stars, billions of galaxies. We can't really even imagine what all is out there. And he spoke all of that into being by the words of his mouth. What an awesome God it is that we approach in prayer and call Father. Isaiah 14, 24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. He thinks, and it comes to pass. As I have thought, it shall come to pass. You see, whatever he dreams up, <laughs> whatever he thinks of, it is nothing for him to bring it to pass. As he purposes, so it will stand. All things are possible with him. He is in heaven. He reigns from heaven. See, we got to get this attitude, this mindset. We need to understand. It, when, when Jesus said, pray like this, our Father in heaven, 
That's not just some pretty language put in there to sound all religious. There's a reason that you pray this way. We're talking to the God of the universe. We're talking to the one who rules and reigns over all. 1 Chronicles 16, 31, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Oh, yeah, we need to rejoice and be glad because our God reigns. Nothing he can't do. I know there are some strange theologians that think that God set everything in motion and he's just left and gone on vacation or something to see how it plays out. But that's not what the Bible teaches. No, the Bible says he reigns. He reigns. He is moving and working in our world, and he has all, a pow all power and authority, our Father in heaven. We need to magnify him. And we'll see how tiny our battles are. There was a time under King Jehoshaphat's reign when a great army was assembled against them and there was no way in the natural that they could survive this attack. But Jehoshaphat gets the people together to pray. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 5, he says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the, of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Jehoshaphat got it right. He tells us three things about our father. He's in heaven, he reigns, and he has all the power. You need to know that when you go to God in prayer. He's in heaven, he reigns, and he has all the power. There's no devil. What do you say here? He says, so that no one is able to withstand you. See, there's no devil, there's no sickness, Listen, there's no addiction or bondage that can stand against him. There's no government, there's no people, there's no man, there's nothing and nobody that can stand against him. Doesn't matter how big the battle, they can't stand against him. We pray to a father who can do anything. He is sovereign God. That means that he has all authority and power above all else. Isaiah 14, 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? Nobody. Nobody. Here's a verse that sums up the sovereignty of God. Psalm 115 and verse 3. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. There are people today that are teaching that God, God's hands are tied. This is what the Bible says. He is a God in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. As I always say, if the scripture wrecks your theology, it needs to be wrecked. He is a God in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. So don't put limits on God. He does whatever he pleases. We say, well, why didn't he do something about my situation? I don't know all the answers. I don't know why sometimes he does some things and other times he does other things, but I do know some. I know that he does whatever he pleases. <laughs> and we need to remember that without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's Hebrews eleven six. It pleases him. To answer prayers that are prayed in faith, that pleases God. Sometimes he doesn't do anything about our situation because we didn't ask. Sometimes he doesn't do anything about our situation because we ask, but we didn't ask in faith. We're just doing some kind of ritual prayer. Sometimes he doesn't do anything when we ask because we're just asking according to our own selfish will instead of praying according to his will. Listen, we're learning how to pray. I'm telling you, we need to get a hold of this tonight. We need to realize that we have a father in heaven who can do absolutely anything. 
but we got to approach him with the right heart and the right attitude. We say, our Father in heaven, it helps us to remember that we're praying to the one who sees everything, he knows everything, and he can do anything. When I pastored in Medill, Oklahoma, there was a time when uh, Carmen was looking for a music teacher position, and she applied in Collinsville, Texas, which was about 35 miles south of where we were in Medill, Oklahoma. And she went down and she interviewed there, um, and the principal told her, he said, well, I wanted to hire you, but so-and-so's daughter, and I got to, you know, the, there were politics at work. He said, I, I can't hire you. I'm going to have to hire this other person. And so she didn't get the job. And school started. And we're about a week or so into the school year. And one day she gets a call from a principal in Whitesboro, which was a little closer and better schools. And it was just the perfect job. And Evidently, the Whitesboro principal had talked to that other principal and said, hey, did you interview anybody that, was, that you thought would be good? And he told, her about, he told her about Carmen, or told him about Carmen. And so that principal calls at 9 o'clock, or she goes down to Whitesboro at 9 o'clock. She comes home at 3. She says, I got the job. It was way, way better. Now, here's the thing. You see, we're praying... Lord, you know, open this door. Lord, work this out. God knows what's best. Sometimes we think God just needs to do what we told him to do. No, you're better off when you ask, but you let God work it out how he wants to do it. He knows what's best. He is in heaven. You see, he has a different perspective. He sees everything. It reminds us God doesn't do things our way. When we say our Father in heaven, we're saying, Lord, you know what's best. You see it all. I hear a lot of teaching on prayer that brings confusion and disillusionment. And they say things like, man, I'm really going to step in it here because this is such a popular teaching in our day and time. They say things like, Pray specific prayers. Okay. So you don't just say, Lord, I need a new job. You say, Lord, I need a new job making $80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. What if God knows better than you do? What if there's things more important than making $80,000 a year? So we moved to Whitesboro. I left for pastoring in Oklahoma. We moved to Whitesboro. If you're familiar with that area, it's very rural. And so for ministry positions, that left me with very few options. And so for about six months, we visited churches, and we finally we heard about a church that might need a youth pastor. And so we went to that church and just felt like that's where we were supposed to be. And we were there for about six months, and didn't seem like they were ever going to hire me or anything, but finally they offered me this great job to be their secretary receptionist for $6 an hour. And I know some of you have heard this story before, but I just want you to understand the sovereignty of God. I want you to understand why we need to learn to trust our Father more. We need to quit telling Him just what He needs to do. We go to Him with our needs, but we don't give God instructions on everything. We need to trust our Father to work things out for our good. So I take this job. Well, I didn't take it at first. I was like, what are you talking about? I've been in full-time ministry 20 years. i got a wife and kids to take care of. I'm not going to make $6 an hour being a secretary receptionist. I just wasn't quite that humble. And then I prayed about it. I called them back, and I said, I'll take it. I took that job. Two and a half months later, they hired me as their youth pastor. And I had one of the most fruitful times of ministry I've ever had for three years. And I got to be my own kid's youth pastor. And I'm trained a pretty good youth pastor, by the way. <laughs> and I wouldn't trade that time for nothing. 
But see, sometimes I'm glad God doesn't do it my way. He knows what's going to work out best. He knows what's really important. And I'm just telling you, he has a different view from heaven. We're praying to the God of heaven. So we pray with humility. We don't go to God telling him everything he needs to do. Why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? I can tell you why God doesn't answer your prayer. It has everything to do with the heart and the attitude. He knows what he's doing. You got to remember who you're talking to. Your father in heaven. He looks down the road and he sees whether this road will lead to blessing or trouble. You can't do that. I mean, we try. You know, we use our wisdom. We do the best we can. I'm telling you, our Father absolutely can. And sometimes what looks good to us is going to be disaster. So we, we're praying to this God who looks down the road, sometimes literally. See, our youth were coming back from camp the other day. Really frustrated. We try to make sure everything is perfect on our vehicles and everything. But they had a flat on the bus. And it's, you know, it's on dual tires on the back. So they weren't stranded on the side of the road or anything. But they went to a tire shop and got another tire put on. Got back on the road. Didn't take that long. But it slowed them down enough. By the time they got back on the highway... There had been a bad accident on the highway, and that slowed them down a little more, so they were a little late. But you know, I just realized, if they hadn't had that flat, they might have been a part of that bad accident. You see, we just don't know, but our Heavenly Father does. And sometimes we get frustrated in our prayer life because He didn't do what we were saying. I'm just telling you, we need to respect the God of heaven that we're praying to, our Father. But he is a great king over all the earth. Amazing. He knows the beginning and the end. We just need to stay humble and never presume to tell the sovereign king of the universe what to do. Never be prideful, especially in prayer. King Nebuchadnezzar found out about who God was. He had quite a lesson in humility. He found out a little bit about who he was. Daniel chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading from verse 30. And I'm going to read all the way through 35 here, so you'll just have to bear with me. But he says, it says, the king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for my royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Quite prideful. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. This is a voice from heaven speaking. And he tells them that this bizarre thing is going to happen to him. In fact, it's, you know, some of the stuff in Scripture is wilder than anything in any movie. But he's going to become like an animal with long hair and claws. It sounds like some rock star from the 70s. But he's going to eat grass like an animal. Seven times will pass over. Most say that's seven years. And I also want to point out to you that it says that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he pleases. Not, it doesn't matter if that fits with your theology. That's the word of the Lord. He rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he pleases or whoever he chooses. 
That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. That means they have no power against him. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wow, what a powerful verse. No one can restrain his hand. We're talking, we say the God of heaven. When we're saying our Father in heaven, we're talking to the one that is unstoppable. No one can restrain his hand. No one can say, what have you done? Now, I've heard a lot of people say, what have you done? But they have no right. That's just foolish human arrogance to question the character of a loving, almighty God who is perfect in all his ways. He always does what is right. And you know, when I read this story of Nebuchadnezzar, some see it as a story of judgment. I do not. I see it as a story of the mercy of God. Because he could have absolutely destroyed Nebuchadnezzar. And instead, in his mercy, he dealt with him in such a way as to turn his heart and to change him. That is an awesome God. In verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven and all whose works are truth, his ways, justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. You look at all of the things that are going on in our world, it seems so out of control, far beyond whatever power, influence that we might have. But our God can turn the heart of a king. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. So we pray with the father mindset, but we also pray knowing that we are praying to the God of heaven, the God of all the earth, that he is awesome, omniscient, omnipotent, and I'm going to say it again, this popular attitude of talking to God like he's your b buddy. Don't ever try to bring the Lord down to your level. He took on a human body. God in the flesh so that he could reconcile us to himself, so he could pay the price for our sins on the cross and redeem us. He is close to every one of us. He lives inside of a believer by his Holy Spirit. But we have to remember that though he is close to us, he's right there with us. He is also the almighty God of heaven. And it's such a dangerous attitude in our world today to create God in your own image. You see, there's a, there's a vast difference between the truth that we were created in His image and creating God in your image. Because when you start creating God in your image, you're bringing Him down to your level. He is not. He is the God in heaven, great king over all the earth, 
who rules and reigns in absolute power and glory and majesty. I hear people say, we're created in his image. That means an exact replica. No, it does not. That is not at all what it means. I can tell you very, listen, it, it, a, a three-year-old can figure this out. It is amazing to me how people can get so deceived with some of this pop theology today. Let me just tell you how we're not exactly the same. He's all powerful. You are not. He knows everything. You don't. I mean, compared to him, we don't know squat. He knows everything. Don't tell me we're an exact replica. He is perfect in all his ways. How about you? I don't know about you, but I messed up a bunch of times today. I mean, I've messed up while I've been preaching this sermon. Don't bring him down to your level. He's your father. He loves you. But we shall always revere him and speak to him humbly with respect and honor, realizing the awesome God that we have the privilege to pray to and to call our Father. Psalm 50 and 21, last verse I'm going to give you tonight. He says, you thought that I was altogether like you. Wrong. Our Father in heaven reminds us we don't have it all figured out. But he does. You know, they say hindsight is 2020. You know, like after it's over, we can look back and say, oh, well, I figured that out now. I understand. Hindsight. Do you realize that it's all the same for him? He doesn't just know what happened. He knows what's ahead. How I need to learn to trust him more and pray to him with a humble heart. Never forget who you're talking to. You're talking to your father who's in heaven. Stand with me. We're going to pray right now.